From the White House in the office of the President of the United States, we present an address by Dwight D. Eisenhower. Judging by the speech Dwight Eisenhower gave when he turned over the presidency to John F. Kennedy in 1961, he learned something about power seekers during his eight years in the Oval Office. He warned the American people of a looming disastrous rise of misplaced power by the military-industrial complex. He foresaw that without a firm commitment to liberty and equality, money and power would become paramount, and American public policy would come to be dominated by a small group of scientific technological elites. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of science. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. This world of ours, ever growing smaller, must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate and be instead a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect. Such a confederation must be one of equals. The weakest must come to the conference table with the same competence as do we, protected as we are by our moral, economic, and military strength. That table, though scarred by many fast frustrations, past frustrations, cannot be abandoned for the certainty agony of, disarm, of the battlefield. Eisenhower's eloquence distills basic concepts that even a child can understand. Allowing any one party, set of opinions, or narrative to dominate an entire society is a dangerous thing. It leads to an imbalance of power, which leads to exploitation and oppression. The only way to ensure a proper balance is to invite everyone to the table and to let them speak with an equal voice. The only alternative is to allow policy to be decided by whoever holds the most power. And those people are rarely the good guys. We've seen this unfold in the disastrous U.S. response to the new virus. Governments around the country have deployed measures without precedent in ways that fundamentally contradict fundamental principles of American law and life. In short, the U.S. copied China. On February 24th, a World Health Organization investigative joint mission held a press conference in which it recommended that the world adopt lockdowns to manage COVID-19. China had formulated and tested a hypothesis, and the WHO rubber-stamped it. That hypothesis was this. COVID-19 disappeared in China because of the actions of the Chinese government. It could not have disappeared on its own due to pre-existing immunity, because there is none. Everyone is susceptible to this new virus. So that you can see that this is not an exaggeration, here are some quotes from the press conference. First, the WHO admits that lockdowns are new to science. They are a hypothesis. The world needs the experience and the materials of China to be successful in battling this coronavirus disease. But if countries create barriers between themselves and China, in terms of travel or trade, it is only going to compromise everyone's ability to get this done because the risk from China is dropping and what China has to add to the global response is rapidly rising. So China didn't approach this new virus with an old strategy for one disease or another disease. It developed its own approach to a new disease and extraordinarily has turned around this disease with strategies most of the world didn't think would work. Because the global community is simply not yet ready in mindset because they feared and felt a responsibility. I heard this again and again in China to protect the world from this virus. And that's what um, really distinguishes this, uh, this country, this response, and the ability to take these old-fashioned strategies, some of the earliest ones we had in public health, 
apply them to the most modern virus, and somehow do that. What China has demonstrated is you have to do this. And you can see the, this is a much flatter curve than the others. And that's what happens when you have an aggressive action that changes the shape that you would expect from an infectious disease outbreak. This is extremely important for China, but it's extremely important for the rest of the world. These measures effectively change the course of the disease as evidenced by the epidemic curves. I think this is one of the biggest achievements during China's fight against the new coronavirus. In the report, we have recommended this method to the international community. Although this is a new virus, so there is no baseline to go by, China and the WHO conclude that the observed outcome was definitely attributable to lockdown. It happened after, so it was caused by. Post hoc, ergo, proper hoc. The logical fallacy at the top of Carl Sagan's baloney detection kit. Ah, not a bear in sight. The bear patrol must be working like a charm. That's specious reasoning, Dad. Thank you, honey. By your logic, I could claim that this rock keeps tigers away. Oh, how does it work? It doesn't work. Uh huh. It's just a stupid rock. Uh huh. But I don't see any tigers around here, do you? Lisa, I want to buy your rock. Perhaps in its rush to justify its draconian actions, China forgot about basic logic. Perhaps they did not consider that there could be an alternative explanation for the disease's disappearance, such as pre-existing immunity. There are other coronaviruses in existence, so they certainly should have. And as it turns out, they did. We now know just how false this conclusion was. One study in Singapore, published in May, found that 100% of people who were exposed to SARS in 2003 and 50% of people who were never exposed to SARS have cross-reactive immunity to SARS-CoV-2. The authors specifically pointed out how important this information was for purposes of policy decisions. The study was ignored by mainstream media, and no lockdown governor has ever talked about it. Sweden rejected the Chinese hypothesis and was rewarded with brutal media smears. Now, a lot of people die under the scenario of herd immunity. One place that resisted lockdowns and gave herd immunity a whirl is Sweden. They've been seen as sort of like the experimental country for all of this. And I have to tell you, regardless of what Atlas says, the results have not been good. Well, that makes sense. After all, death is Swedish. Now, I just want to take a moment to say we should not be taking medical advice from Sweden, as Atlas seems to be doing. They, they seem smart over there, but they're mostly just blonde and tall. It's dumb. It's, do I look dumb? It held firm to its approach, and far from experiencing the 96,000 deaths predicted by the models, Sweden has perfectly average mortality in 2020. Stockholm's hospitals never overflowed, which collapses the whole purpose of lockdown, flatten the curve, to save the hospitals, and single-handedly disproves China's hypothesis. China and the WHO were wrong. There is significant population immunity to COVID-19, and that is why the disease dissipates without killing more people than an average flu season. So why are our politicians still acting like that is true? Are they really this stupid? Politicians have proved the truth of Orwell's astute observation. No one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. They are currently handpicking which industries will die and which will survive. Technology and media are doing well. Zoom is now valued the same as Boeing. The same entities selling lockdown are benefiting from it. Abuse by government of public health emergencies is nothing new. In 1985, the American Association for the International Commission of Jurists specifically recognized as much and convened to draft the Syracuse principles to stem the illegal and unwarranted states of emergency governments use to repress and deny the fundamental rights and freedoms of peoples. Under the UN's International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, certain freedoms are guaranteed, including 
the pursuit of economic development, the right to a personal means of subsistence, the right to liberty, including freedom of movement, and the right not to be subjected to medical experimentation without consent. Under the Syracusa principles, any infringement on these rights must be interpreted strictly and in favor of the rights at issue, in direct response to a pressing public or social need, pursue a legitimate aim, be proportionate to that aim, and be terminated in the shortest time required to bring an end to the public emergency. The state bears the burden of justifying each and every restriction it imposes on freedom, and under public health ethics, the most restrictive measure available is the mandatory isolation of sick patients. More stringent measures than this are impossible to justify with the examples of Sweden, Florida, South Dakota, and other lockdownless places out there, handling COVID-19 just fine with common sense measures of the past. Our governments are ignoring public health ethics. They have hijacked science, imposed life-altering edicts based on bad theories, manipulated everyone with media and technology, and now tell us we can never return to normal. What is the end game? It can't be good. Because if I know, if I don't do so, I might be affected and infect my dad, mom, and my brother. If they are sick, they might die, and I won't see them anymore. I will be even more upset. Coronavirus, coronavirus is a global health emergency. Everyone on this earth has a responsibility to stop it. It should not be a political matter to be used against other nations. To those national leaders, stop blaming each other. Forget about your own interests. The virus won't go away by winning up political argument. We should use our strength, power, determination, and courage all together to fight with this common enemy, coronavirus. Eisenhower's prediction of an imbalance of power has come to pass. Lockdown is the ultimate seizure of control. Let's hope it can be reversed. And that in the goodness of time, all peoples will come to live together in a peace guaranteed by the binding force of mutual respect and love. I look forward to it. Thank you and good night. We have presented the farewell address by the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who spoke this evening from his office in Whitehall.